The topic is basically what are cities doing to become smart? And so we've put together a wonderful panel who's going to be moderated by Jeff Chu. We're very lucky to have Jeff and his panel join us. And Jeff is editor for Fast Company. So I'd like to ask you to help me give them a round of applause and ask uh, Jeff to, to lead the conversation. So big round of applause for you. Thank you all for being here. I'm delighted to be back in Miami. I actually went to high school here, so I don't need many excuses to come back and eat in Miami. Um, I am joined by two gentlemen who are probably most notice, notable for being big FC Barcelona fans. Um, <laughs> they were chatting away about, about Barca before this, but uh, let me introduce them to you. Directly to my right is uh, Jordi Botifol, who is the president of Latin America for Cisco Systems, a company that's doing a huge amount of work on smart cities around the world right now. And to Jordi's right is uh, Ellis Wand, who is coordinator of the Emerging and Sustainable Cities Initiative at the Inter-American Development Bank. Uh, the bank is doing, on a different level, a huge amount of work to lay the groundwork uh, for smart cities, which we will talk about shortly. Over these couple of days, there's a lot of talk about big data, about big solutions to big problems in our cities. Uh, the promise of technology to make citizens' lives better. But you only get good answers if you're asking good questions. So I'm hoping that we'll be able to talk about some of the right questions to be asking as we're trying to build cities for tomorrow. Uh, and I thought a good place to start would, was actually to define what a smart city is. You know, it's one of those buzzwords that's floating around. But what do we mean when we're talking about smart cities? So if both of you could give one or two examples uh, of the kinds of applications that you see at work in building a smart city and, and give a little bit of a definition that would be helpful. Ellis, why don't we start with you? Sure, thank you, Jeff. Um, for us, a smart city is a, a city government and citizens who can actually have access to the use of applied technology to, to improve the city management and to improve their, their quality of life. In our program, we work with the concept of emerging cities, which are really intermediate cities, between 100,000 to 2.5 million, but that are growing demographically and economically above and beyond the national average. No? These are the cities where growth is going to be. No? So there, what are we doing? <clears throat> at, the, at the city government level, a couple of things that we're doing in terms of uh, using applied technology is we're working with a lot of our partners, partners like, like Cisco here to my left, on <clears throat> developing integrated operations monitoring centers. These use very run-of-the-mill technology, you know, hardware, software, and TV cameras, but to basically build a control system that would be able to have traffic mobility, a natural disaster prevention, and, and security. And believe me, just, just, just having the security and the national prevention disasters in place it adds a lot to the quality of life of that particular city. Another area that we're working a lot to use uh, applied technologies is just trying to improve the efficiency of, of the city management. But basic things, I mean, technology today has developed so well in terms of using georeference techniques. And, and, and part of the big problems these cities have sometimes is that they don't have the systems to be able to have property registration that would then be able to collect the taxes from these uh, properties, which is, is, is a huge uh, source of funding uh, for the city. So using these reference techniques, using existing software, we're trying to beef up the capacity that these uh, uh, cities management have in order to be able to do a much better work at the property taxes issue. No? On the citizen side, I mean, you'll be amazed in our intermediate cities how many time citizens expend just trying to go to the public hall to get a, a license renew, uh, to get a work permit, uh, to pay their taxes, when you know half the world does this already via the web. And we're not talking about you know a rocket uh, launch to the moon. I mean, this is very <coughs> run-of-the-mill technology that by applying it will make the life of these guys so much better if they can do half of what they do today, spending one day in the public hall from their homes. 
Jordi, what does a smart city mean to well, you? Well, I think we are, we are totally on the same page. Um, a smart city connects people, processes, technology, and really optimize that connection uh, with the intention to foster more economic, social outcomes with sustainability. Smart city knows how to take advantage of our big data analytics to produce new business models. Some examples, we can see that some examples today here in our booth demonstration. A company, for example, as a partner, Streetline, they have, uh, they have developed a software for parking management. Parking management is important in a city. 30% to total time we waste looking for a parking manager, um, a parking in there. So you can imagine that, how it impacts to the productivity of the entire city. We have another part of ECUSI. Uh, in terms of public safety, they, they also can demonstrate to you a common center, big part of a city, common center that agglutinates in many, many areas uh, around. We also have another example, LFA Digital, about the citizen services with a kiosk uh, that they have all across the cities. They have a bunch of examples, real examples, all across. You, all, you can see also in the education element, the virtual classroom, which how we can leverage, how we can leverage the education, the universal one, when we have a remote subject expert, matter experts all across, we can connect teachers from US, teachers from Europe to Latin America, all across, and you can get a kind of a, a great collaboration all across the different class, elevating the education with a key part. Healthcare, and the cost, what the healthcare means, we can use remote healthcare all across. You have seen, you have seen also in the entrance a track, Cisco track. That Cisco track is the emergency track. It's for disaster recovery. Today in the World Cup, in the upcoming World Cup events, event, there will be 27 tracks of those in some of the cities in Brazil. So if anything is broken, whatever, whatever happened, those tracks should replace the governance, the emergency elements of a city in the meantime that we, so, so many things. But at the end, there is one key subject in the smart city definition. It's a key component for the competitiveness of any country, especially in Latin America, where we need to increase innovation and competitiveness. And innovation is the outcome of in a smart city. So this doesn't just happen, obviously, right? It, it, uh, a smart city just doesn't grow up out of the ground without any investment. So Ellis, can you talk a little bit about what kind of leadership needs to be in place? Because a smart city obviously needs to have smart leaders. And what kind of infrastructure is required to enable this kind of thing to happen? Smart leaders, but you also need a knowledge base within the city government no? to understand what the concept is. See, the, the, the cities that we work with, I mean, if you take the exception of, of the large capitals in, in Latin America, you know, Rio, Buenos Aires, Mexico, Bogota, these cities have uh, an existing uh, broadband infrastructure, uh, ICT, that really does not allow them today uh, to run many applications. In average, or intermediate cities uh, run download and upload at a fifth of the velocity of the speed that they do their counterparts in Europe or in the United States. No? So in order to be able to consider <laughs> using smart technology, you first need to have the basic infrastructure of broadband. And there, uh, not only you need also to capacitate the city officials, but private sector has a very important role. A an example. We're working in, in a city in Argentina, which is in the middle of Patagonia. Small, but very important city because it's going to be getting multi-billion dollars worth of investment in gas development. This city has a top-of-the-art hospital, 65 beds. It was given to them as a donation with all the computers, all the software, everything. Insurance companies cannot access the files because in that city, connectivity is very poor. <laughs> And, and I can tell you stories about universities with the same kind of thing. So, so very important that the city understands that in order to run applied smart technology, you need to have a certain investment made before. We even encounter some mayors that have already gone and buy some software, some application, spend half a million, a million dollars, and then they cannot run it because they don't have the ICT broadband infrastructure. So one thing we're doing uh, with partners, for instance, with, with Cisco now, we're working in the city of Vitoria in, in Brazil, 
their team and our team, and we're running a very fast track diagnosis in, okay, what is the current status of the ICT broadband infrastructure in Vitoria? What would you like to run you know, in five, 10 years' time instead of smart applications of technology? What do you need in terms of investments? You don't have the funding. How can we structure something with the private sector that can bring in the funding, and then you can have the connectivity? And, and, and Jordan was quite right. I mean, this is a very important element of competitiveness. And, and, and without competitiveness, a city is not going to track investments. And without investment, we're not going to create formal jobs. So Jordi, you've got some examples uh, of cities where Cisco is working to build smart cities, some examples of cities where this has already happened. Can you mm -hmm. build on what Ellis just said and, and take us on yeah. a little tour? I think Ellis said something that quite, quite important, which was about leadership. A strong leadership in a city is, is, is a key factor. To have the ability to put together all different elements and management process into a city and to integrate them with the same common objective, that's crucial. So also to take advantage of the big data analytics to understand how we create new models, new ecosystem, new industries uh, all across. So there are a bunch of examples of cities around the world. I, I, I think we listened to the mayor of Miami, uh, Mr. Carlos Jimenez, early this morning, that uh, his vision about Miami and the Miami evolution. Miami is a great example. Miami is actually uh, the city to go into Latin America. Everybody in Latin America, they watch Miami. So we have Carlos Jimenez leadership here. We have Manny Medina, visionary leadership. We have also Angel Petisco, the CIA of the city. That they, they are looking, they are working to set up a clear proof of concept and really showcase for different Latin America areas, working in different areas here. Now, the other city, which is uh, uh, recently awarded the most innovative city in Europe recently, and his mayor, uh, one of the most 50 influential leaders in the world, because of that, uh, is Barcelona. So, perhaps more than provide you more data. There is a video, very self-explanatory. Let's launch the video, maybe people will make opinion. As the world continues to urbanize, with 180,000 people a day moving into cities, the competition between cities will continue to grow economically, environmentally, and even socially. The cities that embrace technology will surface as the winners. Think about it, only 1% of what can be connected is connected today. Imagine the possibilities. The internet of everything has arrived and is ready to change the world. Cisco is extremely excited about Barcelona because the city is utilizing the internet of everything. By connecting its people and things, to a city Wi-Fi, Barcelona is creating new services, richer experiences, and unprecedented economic opportunity for its people, for its businesses, and for its partners. Barcelona is a social dream, and technology is able to make this social dream possible. We face in Barcelona the same, the very same problems that uh, every city in the world faces. So we want to tackle those problems with technology. What we're trying to put in place is a common solution for all the cities of the world. It is estimated that 40% of traffic in city centres is caused by cars trying to find a parking space. Now, in-ground parking sensors communicate with devices in cars to help vehicle owners quickly find an available spot. Putting sensors in parking spots allow us to get less cars, less traffic, people happy, so that the city becomes a more livable place. We have to make it possible for people to understand that the internet might be changing their daily life to improve it. We transform the experience of wasting your time waiting for the bus into an, a, a contact, a full contact with the city. People can find information on routes for the bus, plus information on the area, business, commerce, shows. Barcelona's citizens not only enjoy the smart bus stop experience, but are also able to maintain their Wi-Fi connectivity while on the bus or underground train. This allows citizens to get the same sensation of connectivity as they get at home. 
Understanding that much of a city's energy waste comes from less than optimal use of lighting, Barcelona is installing highly efficient streetlights which are dynamically managed to save energy, optimize maintenance and provide a safe environment for citizens. A city-wide network of sensors provides city officials with concrete information so that they can make decisions based on real-time data. Getting information on the flow of citizens, on noise, on pollution, on traffic, on weather conditions, allows cities to streamline the city operations, reduce costs, and also improve overall sustainability. Economic sustainability, social sustainability, and environmental sustainability. Barcelona can generate a blueprint of what the cities can become, and this is what gives sense, full sense to what we're doing in Barcelona right now. Technology is for people, technology is for using it, and technology is for improving citizens' lives. We are sure that the Barcelona of the future will be even much better than it is now. Smart cities represent places where people will want to live. By connecting the unconnected, cities will be completely transformed. These are the cities that will harness the power of the internet of everything. So full disclosure, uh, Barcelona is, as you may have guessed, Jordi's hometown. That's not why we're featuring it. Um, Jordi, but now, now I live here in Miami oh. <laughs> for two years. <laughs> uh, what's happening in terms of sharing the lessons from Barcelona with cities in Latin America? Can you talk a little bit? Well, about uh, yeah, most of the cities, they have the same, the, the common challenges. So it's very easy to share those. That, that cities like Miami, Barcelona, they have a lot of footprint into Latin America, culturally speaking. Uh, even from a technology point of view, they can provide a lot of experience. They, we don't need to reinvent the wheel in any specific space. Whatever we, whatever we do, whatever we make, it must be very scalable. And again, we were talking about producing new business model. The economic, economic outcome, economic development, social development, it comes from the ability to build up something very competitive. So there are many, I think that the future is more the future of the cities rather than the future of the states. Cities will work all across, and the cities will absorb more and more population. Latin America, currently, we have more than 80% people into the cities, so it's crucial to improve the competitive and the standard of living of those cities, because if the innovation will come from those cities. And we, hit, we have to share knowledge, sharing knowledge uh, replicating the best models is actually to accelerate all this process much faster. So Ellis, the bank is, is working in a lot of ways to be an intermediary to bring some of that knowledge. Uh, where in Latin America do you see the most fer fertile soil for smart cities and what are you all doing specifically to kind of till that soil and prepare the ground? We recently launched a presentation on Latin America in 2025, which is Latin America for the next 10 years. No? And that is telling us that income per capita in Latin America is going to double. Uh, the size of these cities that we're working in, these intermediate emerging cities, is also going to double. Uh, the use of these handheld devices is currently around 300 million users in Latin America. It's going to grow to 550. <coughs> uh, these are Cisco <laughs> figures. Data. Uh, communication uh, that has uh, sent is going to multiply by 13 times. What we're seeing is a, a, a wave of technology that, that is coming at the citizen level. We're worried that we need to prepare the city governments. We need to prepare them in order for them to be able to have the architecture that is needed for this to work. No? And, and obviously this is happening also because in the, the telecom sector is probably the one where there is more private sector participation in Latin America and where it's the most deregulated and, and that is, is making this possible. But we need to work with the, with the government, with the city governments and need to, that, that learning curve, we need to really push it forward. No? So, so we can really reap the benefits of, of these just metrics that I told you, uh, that I share with you right now. No? So we're working on, on our program. In our program, a, a smart technology cuts across all the sectors. I mean, from mobility to security, from fiscal governance uh, to uh, water and sanitation to solid waste, it cuts across. The other thing that we think is happening 
and, and, and we're seeing that already in the last two years in terms of, of the citizen participation. And citizen participation is also based not just on ideology, it's based on technology. It's because of people can communicate better. What we're seeing is with the numbers that I just gave you, governance in our cities is almost going to be online <laughs> when there's a hole in a particular avenue that is bothering us they're going to have to repair that hole in two days because people are going to flood them with things. Same thing is going to be with, with, with uh, hospitals, with schools, with security. We, we see this uh, as a very positive movement where citizen participation will be more increased. I mean, the problems in, in, in Chile in education, in, in Brazil with mobility, a lot of that has to do with the interconnectivity that people have. And we see this as a very positive factor. But are the bureaucrats psychologically ready for this kind of uh, activity? No, that's, I think, the frontier that we have to push. And, and that's exactly what we're trying to do with our program. Actually, we're investing a lot in training these people just to understand how to use technology and, and how technology can really improve the way in which they manage the cities. No? And Jordi, what about for, for you all? What are you looking for in terms of leadership when you're looking for partners? Mm. Because obviously, you can't do this yourself. Uh, well, the partners ecosystem is, is, is a big company, a big asset for this. But let me connect with Elias' comments about the, the funding and about, I remember a few years ago, five, six years ago, when we were discussing this concept in Europe, the European community, they offer funding overall. But the challenge is that most of the cities, they were not able to take advantage of that, those fundings because they didn't come up with the right compelling project. So leadership in a city t must take seriously to develop a framework, a city protocol, to really come up with a really compelling, serious project. And then organizations like IDB, who are crucial, very important for all of us, and they are really committed to develop that. They match up with that, those ideas. So I wouldn't lie that happened like it happened in Europe many years ago. Because again, pace is important, the pace here. We need to make it faster. The Elias organization is very committed. We have a common initial uh, experiences. So let's try to replicate it. So let's ask to all those leaders in the cities, please look at what they have done uh, so far, replicate those best models, come up with a very compelling customized solution. It must be based in a city, city protocol. It must be in a clear framework and they less accelerated. Speaking of making the, the pace faster, we wanted to bring you into the conversation. If you've got some questions, we've got a couple of mic runners, uh, and you can join the conversation. Just raise your hand. Uh, if not, I'll just keep talking, because that's what I'm here for. Uh, <laughs> back there. I usually don't need one of these, but I think we're all pretty, uh, pretty exhausted. Um, Barcelona, just getting back from there last year, just totally impressed by what that city has done. I uh, had an uh, opportunity with Ashoka Fellow, uh, from the gentleman from uh, City Mark, just talking about how Barcelona's lessons about how they've gone about uh, purchasing and, and going through those pieces. Um, are you seeing that, uh, where else are you seeing that in, a, in our little region where someone has the foresight, I know somebody said what it's right for it, but that has the leadership now that we could assist and learn from. And what other good examples do you have of, of cities that are on the forefront? I mean, something must be happening in Montevideo. No? We, we work in Montevideo. Montevideo is, is a city that is part of the program, and, and their connectivity was never a real issue. But something must be happening because Uruguay alone, in 2013, exported more software, more applications than any other country in Latin America. And you're talking about a very small country. No? My hunch is that this is more private sector driven than, <coughs> than it is public sector. All the public sector must have some policy in place and must have built some infrastructure there so these guys can really have the access to the technology and, and, and develop. This is innovation. This is competitive. No? So something must be, they must be doing right. <laughs> There are, there are very interesting initiatives. Uh, for example, Ciudad Creativa Digital in Guadalajara, Mexico. Uh, Medellin, 
for example, in some of the specific hot spots and our mobility concept. Rio de Janeiro, they are working heavily to be prepared in front of the Olympics Games. Uh, Yachay in Ecuador, for example, very interesting uh, in the concept of an intelligent uh, greenfield city, because there are two kinds of, of cities, brownfield and greenfield. So but let, me, let me answer the question in general terms. I think the most important point is, is to make sure you develop a hub around innovation we call. You were talking about the Barcelona case. Barcelona was, uh, uh, at the end of the 60s, 11% uh, total city extension. They were based on a textile industry. That textile industry became obsolete. That area was abandoned, factories, it was a high level of delinquency. After the Olympics, the city took seriously, how do, how do we renovate that area? Today, it's uh, the most intelligent district, they call 22 Act District. Today, that district produces thousands and thousands of qualified jobs. They have thousands of new companies, based upon, most of them technology bases and information society driven uh, models. Today, Barcelona has a deficit zero. Bearing in mind the difficulties in all the Spain, Spanish economy, deficit zero that, that allowed them to increase substantially more investment around. And big part of the incomes that allow them to have deficit zero is based on the 22 Act. So it's talking about, I think there are a lot of leaders in Latin America that are really thinking, they are really building things. So there are a lot of ideas already settled. The point is how we can accelerate this. Because, uh, let, me, let me, to be more specific, why? Because in growing time is the time that we need to pay more attention on that. Because the, 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 those economies that are competitive, those countries, the competitiveness is really not in good shape. By the way, most of the Latin American countries, you take the World Economic Forum, ranking competitiveness, you will see the most advanced, most advanced country in Latin America is Chile. It's in the position 33, 34. But some of the, the rest are in 45, 55, even 60. Spain was in the 33, and Spain went through a nightmare because their economy was fragile. So you can imagine, uh, just in to compare, so when you get uh, tough cyclical economics uh, models, right, is to avoid that, make sure you make faster, you, you accelerate this, and then your cyclical economic changes will be s smoother, right, more, uh, not sub, sub, such a strong or, or, or abrupt elements. I think we have time for one more super quick question here in the green right up front. Do Hello, I'm Carrie Penabad from the University of Miami. And I was wondering if you could say something about how you see the informal sector playing a role in this uh, goal for interconnectivity, meaning the informal city or the informal economies that rise out of the informal city in this plan for interconnectivity, particularly in Latin America? We will want for the informal sector to be formalized. <laughs> and if in the internet and the technology is a way to do it, we will welcome it. In Latin America today, we are in, in, in figures that we never thought. You know, 60% of the labor force works in the informal sector. These guys do not have insurance. These guys don't pay taxes. These guys are not protected. That, that, that cannot be. That, that, that just is simply, you know, increasing the inequity uh, and increasing the exclusion. If there's a way we could use technology to have these guys with an HTTP address and, you know, get them and, and be able to formalize them, that would be my take. Well, I would say on the same page, connectivity, transparency, allow us to reduce in, informal model, informal world and new business model that engage, uh, I would say, a major percentage of population will help also to reduce that. I think that's a good question to end on. It gives us a sense of the magnitude of the challenge, right, as well as the, the optimism and the possibilities of the solution. So will you join me in thanking Ellis and Jordi for their comments? Thank you.